Hello, my name is Chad Jones. I'm Vice President Strategy and Product Management with Dynamic Ops. Today I'm excited to show you the Dynamic Ops platform and how we enable a private cloud. I've got a lot to show you today, so let's get right into it. So, what we have in front of us here is our demo uh, infrastructure. And we have three different roles inside of our system. The first role is the administrator, which sets up the Dynamic Ops Cloud Automation Center. We then have a group provisioning administrator, which is a non-IT person, which is able to approve their group's requests and see just their group's machines. We then have a user who is able to request resources from the cloud and manage their own resources within the security constraints set up by the administrator. So when we see the interface here, this is actually my user, Dan, who I am logged in as right now. When we look at the front screen, we can see the different events that they have going on. Uh, and we can go into the dashboard and get a look at virtual, physical, and cloud resources and get an idea of what this user is using. So they can always keep track of themselves and do self-policing of their resources. Now, when we go into self-service, you'll notice that there are two options. There's My Machines is the first option, and Request Machine. So in My Machines, you can see that Dan has three types of machines because Dynamic Ops is able to manage servers and desktop on physical and virtual infrastructure on public and private cloud capacity. As noted inside of the interface, you can see that Dan has virtual machines assigned to him as well as physical and cloud. Cloud is our nomenclature for Amazon EC2, so this uh, particular machine is living out in the public cloud. You can go in and actually control some of these uh, uh, machines directly through the right mouse click menu. You notice that there are different um, options inside of the right mouse click menu depending upon their security. So now, you know, Dan has to go in and actually do his job. So if we go into request machine and we go, we'll see inside of here two sets of blueprints, consult consulting services and development. So Dan's going to have to do some development around, you know, a SharePoint server because you know, that's what Dan does. He does development of web parts. So Dan's going to go in and say, okay, I'm going to select my SharePoint template. Now, inside of here, you'll notice that there are different options for Dan to use to create his cloud. So he can go in and say, okay, let's request a certain number of machines. He's just going to need one in this case. What's the least duration? So we don't want to just have the resource hanging out there and being orphaned for forever, because that takes resources and it's not an efficient use of infrastructure. So we're going to put a 30-day lease so that at the end of 30 days, it will expire and we reclaim those resources number of CPUs, uh, amount of memory, and the amount of storage. Now, you'll notice that there's a value range here between uh, 2 and 4 CPUs, 2 gig to 4 gig of RAM, and 50 to 100 gig of storage. Now, that means that approvals are required if you go above those limits. Now, you'll see here that by default, you've met the 2 gig limit, so you're going to need to go through an approval. You know, so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and say, well, I'm going to add four gig to my system. So I'll enter that, enter that in. I need, enter in a description, I need this for testing. And then a reason for the request. I am making a new web part for SharePoint. So that lets his manager know why he actually needs this machine. And that goes through the automated approval chain. So Dan goes ahead and says, okay. Now you'll see up top that the request has been submitted and you'll get an email when the process has been completed. Now, I'm going to go over to Dan's manager. His name is Rich. And when we go inside of here and we click on the Dynamic Ops logo and refresh, you'll see that there are machine requests requiring your approval. Now, Rich has a few other uh, items inside of his dashboard because he is a group provisioning manager. So when we go in, we'll go ahead and say view requests. So now what will come up is the right to authorize that request from Dan to Rich. Now here's the request. You'll see that he's making a SharePoint 2010 uh, you know, server request. It's virtual, exactly who the owner is, what the group is, what's the daily cost for that actual machine? $26 a day, pretty pricey. Well, thank God that we're requesting that 30-day lease because if we go beyond 30 days, that could get to be an expensive machine if we forget about it. And now we look at the overall lease cost, it's $799. And 
And what's the reason that he needs this? Well, he's making a new web part for SharePoint. Well, that's pretty important for my business, so I'm going to go ahead and let him do that. So I'll go ahead and comment back and say, great, look forward to it. And I'll go ahead and approve. Now, there is a full email chain that goes on with this as well. So in the background, there are emails that go back and forth. We're not showing that as part of this demo. We're just showing the interface. So now I'm going to go ahead and say, OK. So now what's going to happen is it's going to go through the system, actually do the approval, and then kick off a personalized workflow to create that SharePoint with the business relevant settings for Dan and his user context. So now all my approvals are done. And I'll go ahead and move back over to Dan. Dan would have received an email, or if he logged into his portal, you'll actually see that, OK, great, it's been approved. And that's down here. You know, approved by my manager, consulting services with Comet, great, look forward to it. And that would be captured in the email as well. Now, along with this, a full audit trail has also been captured so that you can see the requests and the approval and the whole, over the whole life cycle of this actual element, this virtual machine. So now if we go into Dan's machines and we say my machines, you'll notice that down on the bottom here is SharePoint 4. And now this is on and you can remote connect to that using RDP to the console and be able to begin doing your testing, install your software, do whatever you need to get that web part created for SharePoint. So that's a very powerful self-service example of a user being able to not only get what they need in the shortest amount of time possible, but do so through an approval chain so that the group administrator can keep control of their budget. He could have very easily said, look, you don't need two gigabytes of RAM or four gigabytes of RAM, you need two gigabytes, and kept his cost down. But now they've had that choice. And the most beautiful thing is that IT hasn't had to be contacted. There's no ticket that went to IT to do this. It just happens, yet IT has a full audit trail and can report on all of these activities. So let's go ahead and take a look at what the administrator sees. So if I come over to my administrator portal, you'll notice on the left-hand side that based upon their role, they have a lot more options here. So inside of their dashboard, they're actually seeing across the context of the entire infrastructure, not just a group's set of machines, but the entire infrastructure. You can see you know, by provisioning group who's using how many resources. You can see what's uh, machines by blueprint, by active state, and the list goes on for the information that you can attain from this dashboard. Now that's for virtual. You can see the same thing for physical, whether it's on HP or Dell or IBM or uh, Cisco UCS, all of these things can be reported. And then also you can see from the cloud standpoint, things that are actually living inside of Amazon EC2. Now right now in this example, we just have a couple machines or one machine that's living out there. Uh, but if I had dozens of them, it would all roll up those reports inside of here as well. So now inside of the enterprise uh, administrator's portal, you'll see this first tab that's discovery. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole wizard here, but what happens is that, and unique to Dynamic Ops, is that we're able to go into an existing environment and discover your entire infrastructure. You don't have to rip and replace or put in net new to actually get the benefits of the cloud. We actually leverage what you have inside of your environment, discover it, and then evolve and mature your current infrastructure into a cloud service. So now, once that's up and working, we then go in and then understand your environment and start to tie together the service. So the first thing that we do is go in and create a reservation. So a reservation basically explains or defines where something can live. So here are, for example, my Dell servers you know, for physical. Or I can go in and say, here are my Zen servers, or ESX, or Hyper-V. We support all of those. So if we go and look at development on Hyper-V, for instance, and we say Edit, you'll be able to see exactly the cost that we have associated with that reservation, uh, what networks are associated with that reservation, what's our reservation policy. It's a Tier 1 resource. Uh, and we can actually add custom properties to that reservation as well. This is really defining the where something can live. So from here, we'll go in and actually define the who. And that's the provisioning group. So we can define inside of here who is able to actually get at a particular service. 
So now if we look at something like consulting services, which our user Dan was a member of, you'll see that we can put in a description for this group. We can put in the default machine prefix. You know, that's actually how the machines will be named for this particular provisioning group. Uh, we can put in the Active Directory container, who the group manager is, that group provisioning manager, who the user roles are. Now that can be done by, you see my Dan's here, that can be done by individual user, but more likely it's going to be done by group. All of these things are supported by group. We can also add custom properties inside of here as well, if they're relevant to my environment. Now from here, we also can go in and define our build profiles. Now a build profile actually defines how you create a machine template. So if I go into, let's say, an ESX Windows desktop, and I say edit, inside of here you'll see that on ESX, using these properties, we'll be able to build a system. Now instead of having to do uh, installation from scratch and having to manually enter in all of your parameters, all of those parameters are listed here. Now, Properties, different property sets, depending upon what, how you're installing the software, can be automatically loaded into this build profile. And then you just simply enter in the answers to those particular properties. So here you can see we have, we're using WIM to actually install here. We also support cloning and link clones and those types of, uh, those types of replication technologies. Uh, you enter in passwords, ISO names, all, everything you need that when this kicks off, this build kicks off, it will have uh, all the properties to successfully build that machine end to end. But you haven't had to do anything in the image. It's all done simply through a point and click type of experience. So now from here, we go into the blueprints. Now the blueprints are what ties together the build profile information, the provisioning users, the who, and the reservations, the where. So now we can see, if we go back into our SharePoint, which we used earlier, and if I say edit, Inside of here, first of all, you'll see the name for the blueprint, description, uh, the groups that it's related to, consulting services, where Dan lives, uh, the machine prefix for the name, uh, and then the approval policy as well, which is for the group manager to approve that. We then can go into the build information and see what are the actual thresholds for approval. What's my minimum, my maximum, my approval? And you'll notice here that we're using WIM imaging workflow to actually create this. Now we're creating it as an installation. We could have an option to clone it if I have an actual template. Uh, or I could go in and create different types of workflows for different types of systems. Linux Kickstart, for instance, if you're using you know, Red Hat. So now, from here we have our cost as well that's also associated with this blueprint. So costing can be held at the build level, at the reservation level, at the group provisioning level, uh, provision group level, and inside of the actual blueprint itself. So it gives you a very granular uh, look at cost. We then can define security as well. What is the user able to do with this actual machine? Uh, you can check or uncheck any of these things. At any time, if you want to change the permissions for this particular blueprint, maybe you no longer want someone to destroy it, simply uncheck and say OK, and it will apply to everyone that has actually created a resource with this blueprint. So now that everything's brought together, when I go back to my machines, you'll notice that, again, when someone does a request here, when Dan does his request, he only sees consulting services and development because those are the groups he's a member of. And then there's his particular uh, blueprints as we just saw clearly defined in the Enterprise Admin Portal. So one other thing I want to show you as well is if we go back to the Enterprise Admin Portal and we go into Reports, we can actually see and report exactly what's going on in the system at any given time. So we can have an executive summary, auditing, uh, auditing, reporting. We can do summaries by physical and cloud, do full capacity and chargeback uh, and reclamation reporting. Another part of our system is the ability to actually identify machines that haven't been turned on for any number of days and then send out reclamation workflows on top of that so you can get those resources back in an efficient manner. Now, all of these things taken together provide the most robust platform for creating a private cloud in the industry today. I encourage you to dig deeper into our system and also look at some of our other videos around the Cloud Development Kit and our public cloud gateway. My name is Chad Jones, and thank you very much for taking the time to join us for this video today.